Good morning again, everyone, and I invite you, if you have a Bible or a device, if you would turn to Romans chapter 14, and that is on page 976, and the new Bibles uh, provided for you uh, there, if you'd like to turn to that. Romans chapter 14. How's everybody enjoying the spring weather? <laughs> hey, let's not start with that question. Um, have you noticed that Christians are all not alike? Have you noticed that there's other people who follow Jesus that have different views than you do on certain things, that have certain preferences than yours? Have you noticed that Christians are not all alike? And what can so easily happen is those differences can lead to disagreements, which can lead to fighting and arguing, which can lead lead to division and churches splitting and relationships fracturing and schisms and all sorts of wonderful things. If you look through world history, you will find in this world made up of people that are different, lots of division, lots of isolation. In fact, right now we're living in an era, it seems to me, where people are just throwing things and killing one another and it's just them and us. And we see that now, but we've seen it through human history. Unfortunately, we have seen that from time to time in church history, where churches fight and disagree and go to war with each other. Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, prayed to his father and said, Father, I pray that the ones that are going to hear the message, the message about me, that they will be one. One in us so that the world will know that that you sent me. In other words, when we are not one, when we fight and argue and split, it's not simply about us not getting along and, oh, we shouldn't do that. It's about the gospel, the message being clouded to a lost world. So in other words, unity is a big deal to Jesus. And a follower of Jesus called Paul 2,000 years ago writes to this church at Rome and says to them, unity is a big deal. So we're returning uh, today to our study of of Romans. Uh, We had two weeks off where we uh, were celebrating Easter and, and the wonderful death and resurrection of Christ. But we're back in the book of Romans. And just so you know, we have three more Sundays yet. Uh, to go until we finish the 16th chapter, and uh, so we're going right to the end of April, and we'll be starting a new series the beginning of May. But in this last section of Romans called Together, what Paul is doing is he is saying to a church where there are lots of differences. In that day, if you were a Jew or if you were a non-Jew, a Gentile in the church, there were huge differences, different backgrounds, different upbringings, and Paul is writing to them about their differences and basically is saying to them, Don't split. Don't argue and fight with each other. But rather, what he's saying to them is that you need to unite under the banner of Jesus. Here's the truth for us this morning. Jesus transcends all things that divide us. Jesus transcends all of these things that divide us as Christians. And in your life, God wants to work. He wants to change you in your relationships with others and with Christians so that you're not a critical, judgmental person. You're not a a Christian that looks down on other Christians and is negative towards other Christians, but rather Jesus wants to make you like you're intended to be made. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to have love and grace and peace as you interact with other people and as you interact with other Christians. So that's what we're looking at today. And before we go on, I just want to mention one other thing just about the importance of this issue. N.T. Wright, who I mentioned last week, is a biblical scholar and uh, a world historian, Uh, just came out recently with a book uh, called Paul, an Autobiography. And it's just an amazing book as he has just detailed the life of Paul who writes the book of Romans. And uh, anyway, he's been asked on more than one occasion uh, this question, if Paul was to come back today to the church in the 21st century, is there anything that would shock him. And without hesitation, N.T. Wright said, the disunity in the Christian church. Not only the fact that Christians aren't united, but they don't care about that. 
And we tolerate that in our Christian churches. You know, this idea, well, we just don't get along and, you know, so we fight. That is not biblical. So does everybody see the importance of that? So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at five ways that you are to respond to another Christian that you don't see eye to eye with, okay? And if you're here today and you say, boy, I see to eye to eye with every Christian, can you come to the front? I'm joking, because we can find somebody that disagrees with you on something, okay? We all, from time to time, run across people, other Christians, that we disagree with or we differ with. So we're looking at five ways to respond when that happens. And before we do that, let's look at the context in, into which Paul is writing. So Romans chapter 14, verse 1, we're going to go through the first 19 verses. Paul writes, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Notice the phrase, disputable matters. Those are matters of dispute, matters of opinion. And Paul is going to say, these are matters where there is to be freedom. We at Woodside call them secondary matters or secondary issues or non-essentials. So Paul's talking about these disputable matters. Now, in first century Rome and in the Christian church in the first century, there were a few disputable matters. And Paul is addressing two of them at the church at Rome. The first had to do with food, and the second had to do with holy days. There were two groups, primary groups, in the church at Rome. And the first group, if you notice the phrase, weak in faith, the first group were Christians who came from Jewish backgrounds. And when he, Paul refers to them as weak in faith, he's not saying that they had less faith, faith than the other grace, group, but rather their faith was weak in, their, in the understanding of grace, in the freedom of Christ, because for them, as little children, they were raised in the ways of the Torah. And many of them memorized the first five books of the Bible um, growing up. And if you read the first five books of the Bible, you're going to come across all sorts of different laws. Do this, don't do that. And there are food laws. This is kosher, this is not kosher. Okay, we don't eat meat from what? Pigs, right? No bacon in your diet, right? You don't do that. Uh, you don't eat shellfish. You don't do that. Okay, so they were raised with that. And then when it came to holy days, they had the Sabbath, but they had other festivals, the Passover and a number of feasts, and they were to observe them, and there was a certain um, uh, 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 protocol for, for those festivals. And so that's what they were raised in. They meet Jesus, and they realize that Jesus um, is sufficient for their salvation, that Jesus fulfills the law, but they had a hard time letting go of the way they were raised. They just felt, we love Jesus, but boy, these things are important. So that's the first group. The second group are the non-Jews, the Gentiles. These are, uh, this group, they didn't grow up in church. This group, many of them came to a saving knowledge of Jesus later in life. They, they were heading, you know, the ways of the world and couldn't care less about God. They find that, that Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose again for them. So they become Christians. They're saved. And to them, they came to the understanding, Jesus paid it all. Uh, I'm right with God because of Jesus. So, hey, I'm free to eat whatever I want to eat. If I want to eat bacon, I can eat bacon. And I'm free to observe certain days or not free. I don't have to celebrate the Passover. I know you guys celebrated that for 1,500 years, but Christ is our Passover. He's our lamb, so I don't need to do that. So you had these two groups disagreeing over these disputable matters. When you look at church history from that day forward, there have been different things on the list when it comes to disputable matters, uh, regard, depending on the time and the place, a different list. We've got a list today. Does anybody today know of a disputable matter in the church? Because if you don't, today's your lucky day. I'm going to share with you a number. Okay, here we go. First, Music in worship. This was a big one back in the 90s. Some of you remember, right? Some Christians, we should have pianos and organs in the church. Maybe they didn't say it in that voice, but we should have. <laughs> Other group, we need guitars and drums. We should play the music slower and softer. We should play it louder and faster. Are you getting the idea, right? Back and forth among Christians. Another thing Christians disagree about, psychiatric counseling or medication to help for depression. Some Christians think, you know what? A good counselor, a good psychiatrist, or proper medication is a gift from God. It's not the ultimate solution, but it can help someone suffering. 
Other people, other Christians, no, I don't think Christians should do any of that. They should just pray. Uh, social drinking of alcohol. I can have a glass of wine. It's a gift of God. Christians really shouldn't drink. Uh, the age of the earth, the sign gifts, women in ministry, mode of baptism, the end times. There is a lot on this list. Politics. Christians should vote this way. No, Christians, you need to vote this way. Uh, education. A Christian should have their child, if they have children, uh, in the public school to be a witness. No. Christians should, home, uh, should uh, have their children in a Christian school. No. Christians should be homeschooled. Okay, am I touching, bringing anybody, anybody's bells, right? Different views. Halloween. Christians can go out on Halloween. Christians shouldn't go out on Halloween. Dancing. It's okay to dance, except if it's a polka. It's okay to dance. Because <laughs> then you've got to listen to the accordion. Okay, um, just, just, just kidding. Okay. Okay to dance, not okay to dance. A couple after service shared to me, oh, don't forget the King James Version only, right? Version of the Bible. Another one said, uh, oh, don't forget clothing, right? Wear a head covering, a bonnet, a head covering. No, you don't have to. Back and forth it goes. Uh, I grew up in the church in the 1970s when I was a young person. And uh, for a while in, in the church there, um, believe it or not, was coffee. Christians shouldn't drink coffee. I didn't drink it at the time, but I thought, boy, that's kind of odd. Um, just to let you know, I'm a coffee drinker. Okay, but all kinds of issues, disputable matters between groups. And Paul says, accept those in the group that you differ with. Accept the person who has a different view from you. Don't quarrel, don't argue and fight, but accept them. Now what does acceptance mean? It means more than simply social etiquette when you see the person put on that you know, pasty smile. It means more than tolerating the person, you know. Glad to see her at Woodside. Wish you'd go somewhere else. And wish you'd get a haircut while you're at it. Um, it means even more than friendliness. The word accept is the idea of welcome with open arms. And that's the way Eugene Peterson in the message translates it. He says, welcoming, welcome with open arms other or fellow believers or other Christians who don't see things the way you do. So in other words, when you come across someone that's got a different view when it comes to dancing or or alcohol, or school education, or medication, instead of taking a step back and say, stay away from me, you step forward and you say, under the banner of Christ who transcends everything, we're still brothers and sisters, we're still family, and my arms are open to you, and uh, I will do that. Uh, this model really fits with what we're talking about today in Romans 14 and next week in Romans 15. Uh, this has been attributed often to Augustine, but it, we're not sure who came up with this, but it is so well said, and it goes like this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In the essentials of the Christian faith that we're very, it's very clear in Scripture, we got to stand united. The deity of Christ the sufficiency of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the second return of Christ, that Scripture is the infallible, inspired Word of God, things like that. Those are crystal clear in Scripture. We, we hold to those things at Woodside, and there's no room for discussion because those are clear. Similar behaviors, murder, stealing from people, committing adultery, we're crystal clear. Those things are wrong. We're not supposed to do them. Now, there is forgiveness and, and healing, but we're not supposed to do those things. We're to be clear on that. Having said that, though, there are things that are non-essentials. These are the essentials. These are the non-essentials. And we talked about some of those things. And in those areas, we are to show liberty, freedom. You see it this way. I see it that way, and we're going to give each other freedom. We're going to agree to disagree in a very loving way. And Paul says, in all things, charity. In all situations, there is to be love. Now, there, is, there are some cases where uh, Christians haven't seen eye to eye, and one uh, part, part or party leaves, 
fellowship is broken, they go you know, to an, another church or something. There are certain situations be, with other factors coming into play where, where that um, happens and you can make a case for that, but that's the exception, not the rule. Paul is saying here is, listen, you need to work this out. You need to learn to accept one another. And he's going to share, share, share five ways that we are to respond when we don't see eye to eye with another person. So here we go. Number one, you don't disrespect or judge those who differ with you. He writes, one, person, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted him. So here are the two groups. We can eat meat. No, you can't. And so for the first group that they just celebrate their freedom in Christ and I can eat whatever I want to eat, he says, don't you treat with contempt. Don't you disrespect don't you condescend. Don't you despise the person that doesn't eat meat. Don't think that they're uninformed. Don't think that they're old school. Okay, don't do that. And then to the other group that likes to put fences around and, and no, let's not eat the meat, don't you judge that person. Don't you criticize that person. Don't you think you're morally superior and a better Christian than that person. Okay, so that's the first way we're to respond. So if you are tempted to criticize or judge or you're tempted to despise or look down on, right now in the presence of God, you need to confess that and say, God, I'm struggling with this person or with these people. Forgive me. Begin to work in me. Second way to respond, you don't play God. And this is a good thing. You get to be released from trying to run the universe. You get to be released from trying to control somebody's life. With these disputable matters, you don't cajole, you don't force, you don't bully someone to see things your way. You've got to change them. Look what Paul says, verse 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. So in the middle, this so often, ha so often is the case, where there's an issue, and we start getting our eyes on the issue, and we're like, oh, you think that? And, we're, and what Paul does here is he gets their eyes on the Lord. And he says, whoa, big picture. Both of you, on both sides of the issue, okay, it's about you and the Lord first. And he says, please note, that the Lord's able to take that other person who you think just doesn't have it right perfectly, he's able to hold that person so they don't fall. He's able to make them stand. In other words, this is my paraphrase. He's got them. You can just take a deep breath and step back. The Lord's got them. He goes on. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another day, another considers every day alike. Again, that was the second disputable matter. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Interesting. Whatever group you're in, you are to have a personal conviction. You're to look at Scripture, read through what it says about the issue, and make up your own mind. That there is to be this freedom. Now, when it comes to essentials, the essentials, or the core tenets of the faith, it's not about making up your mind. Hmm, Jesus is deity. How do I like that? No. That's the truth, whether you like it or not. So, so you don't make up your mind on that. The making up the mind, my, my opinion versus that person's opinion, on these secondary issues, that's what we do. And that's what Paul calls for them to do. And then he goes on. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Notice that phrase, does so to the Lord, and then gives thanks. What Paul is saying here is that both groups are able to honor God. They're doing it to the Lord. They're honoring the Lord. They're giving thanks to the Lord in their actions. And what Paul is saying is that two people can see an issue differently and both honor and give thanks to God. Did everybody get that? Because there's a lot of Christians that don't get that. If you don't have my view on this issue, you're not honoring the Lord. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. Both can honor the Lord on both sides of the agreement. Paul goes on, for none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. 
For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the, living, of both the dead and the, the living. And Paul is, again, putting Christ in view and saying that we're not living for ourselves, but there's Christ in the picture. So he's living for Christ, she's living for Christ, you're living for Christ, we're all owned by him. Again, he's getting your eyes on Jesus. And then he goes on, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister, or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Two judgments in scripture for the non-Christian, it's Revelation 20, and for the Christian, it's 2 Corinthians 5. And there's coming a day where you will give an account of your life. It's not something you should fear, but it's something that you should keep in view because it, how you live matters, and it's a day of rewards. But you will one day stand before Jesus Christ, and you'll give an account to him. You won't stand before another Christian. You won't stand before a pastor. You will stand before him. So what Paul is saying here, in these disputable matters, don't play God. God's God. Let, he's got it. He's the one that judges, and he's the one that sees the big picture. He's the one that sees people's motives. So, for example, if you're here and you have a, a glass of, of wine, and you're okay with that, and you see someone else, and they don't, another Christian, you're like, why are they so... I don't know, you people that are there, what do you think? Why are they so uptight? Like, why not just have a glass of wine? It's a gift from God, not hurting anybody. But maybe you don't know the whole story. Maybe someone in that person's family has been killed by a drunk driver. Or maybe someone in that person's family struggles with alcohol. And so that person that doesn't drink is not doing it because they want to be a legalist. It's because they have a personal conviction. They'd rather not drink. So we have to just give it to God and not Try to judge other people. Another example is a worship pastor at a particular church came out and would wear bare feet when he led worship. Do we have any at Woodside? Okay, it's not about our worship leaders at Woodside, okay, just so you know. But he'd come out in his bare feet. And, um, of course, the pastor got some cards saying, we don't like when the worship leader is wearing bare feet. And I'm not sure if they put a Bible verse or something there, but we just don't like it. So the pastor talked to the worship uh, pastor about it, and the worship pastor was very good and said, you know what, if, if it's distracting people from worship, I'm going to put my, my shoes and my sandals back on. And he did, and, and he was okay with it. But what the people didn't know that wrote those cards was that this worship pastor, before every Sunday and leading worship, he was in the back in a room with his shoes on or sandals, and he took them off, envisioning Exodus chapter 3, where Moses uh, was before the burning bush, and the Lord said to Moses, Moses, take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. And he did that as a way of preparing for worship and saying, Lord, this is not about my performance. This is about holy ground. Please help me to lead worship well, okay? So when you are tempted to play God and judge and, you know, read into things, take a step back, okay? God's got it, okay? Number three, you don't harm those who differ with you by your actions. In other words, the person you don't see eye to eye with, you're to be conscientious of them, you're to be sensitive to them, Paul goes on, verse 13, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Make up your mind, and he's speaking primarily here to the ones that exercise their freedom, that you don't do something by your actions that's going to trip up someone that holds to the different view, that's going to hurt them. Paul goes on to say, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is, in clean, is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. Paul says, hey, just want you to know with this issue, whether meat is clean or not clean, I believe you can eat any meat that you want. It's all clean. Jesus came to fulfill the law, and it's all clean. That's just my view. But it's really interesting here that, G, that Paul doesn't settle the issue. He doesn't say, 
this is my view, so this is the right view on this secondary issue, so everybody has to believe what I believe and do what I do. He could have settled it, but he didn't. And what he's doing here is he's, he's sharing with us that all issues are, of, of, are not of equal importance, that there are some that are essentials, but there are some that they're still important, but they're less important. And he's saying with these less important ones, there's room for another view. And he lifts this out. If you read in Acts chapter 15, there's something called the Jerusalem Council where within the churches, they're talking about these disputable matters because there's some friction among the Christians, and in particular the church at Antioch and whether um, the Christians should eat meat sacrificed to idols there uh, in that church in that region. And Paul, who says, you can eat any meat that you want. That's my own view. He's a leader at the church of Jerusalem, a uh, leader at, at the Jerusalem Council, one of the leaders, and he, with them, sent a letter to the church at Antioch and say, you know what? It's probably best if you don't eat any meat. Holding to this view, but I'm open to this other view. Boy, that's speaking volumes to us as Christians. Then he goes on, verse 6, 15 and 16. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy or hurt or harm someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. So in other words, Paul is saying, limit your liberty. If you think you can do this, hey, you need to be sensitive to the person that doesn't think that that's the best thing to do. You may think you can play... <laughs> be careful here. Yes, you can have your glass of alcohol, but don't try to force somebody else to have a drink that would rather not. Don't try to conjole them. If you're going to a movie... And you think it's okay, and there's someone, well, it's, I really don't like going to movies because of this, this. Don't try to force them to go to a movie. Okay. That's the idea uh, that Paul is saying here. And I just want to say in this whole discussion, whatever side you tend to lean on, you're a little more, you like to make fences, or you're a little more, you like to really celebrate your liberty, you got to watch out on either side. For those of us that are over here, and we tend to like say, you know, you really shouldn't do, I don't think you should do that, I don't think you should do that. We gotta be careful and guard against legalism where we go down that path. But if I'm over here with the liberty, I gotta guard against worldliness and permissiveness. Because not every movie is a movie you should go to. And not every place where there's a dance is a place you should go to. So we have to limit our, limit, our liberty and we think those three things through. But with that being said, we need to be watching uh, or looking out for the other person, being sensitive to them. And it doesn't mean that you're like, okay, what does everybody think, you know, whether I should do something or not do something, okay? Do you think I, it's okay for me to play Uno or Skippo? You know, am I going to cause you to stumble? You don't want me to? Okay, I won't. No, it, you got to use discretion there, right? But you're sensitive to other Christians. And you're not wanting to be a stumbling block. Instead, you're trying to remove any stumbling block for the other person. 150 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a dentist in a, a church, and he was a steward of communion, so when the church had communion, uh, he'd be there handing out the, the cup and the bread. And 150 years ago, the churches were really struggling with uh, alcoholism in the land and Christians uh, getting drunk. And um, so anyway, he's handing out the communion, realizing it's wine. And for the alcoholic, this was a stumbling block, right? You're trying to, that little taste maybe will get, you know, lead to a bend again. Or maybe someone that doesn't drink and that little, that wine could cause something there. So as a, as a, um, a dentist, he was also an um, amateur chemist. And so he went home and thought through and came up with a way or a formula of taking the grape and without refrigeration, because there wasn't a lot in that day, without taking the grape and getting it into the cup without it fermenting. How do you do that? And he came up with a way to do that. And so his church, other churches, and today our church, to this very day, we don't drink wine on Sunday mornings. We drink juice, grape juice. 
when he came up with this, thinking of, you know, I don't want to be a stumbling block to other, we don't want to be a stumbling block to Christians, the people in the church and other churches not only liked it, but the people outside of the church, churches liked it as well. And so he and his son started to sell it in grocery stores. But instead of calling it what they first called it, non-alcoholic sacramental church wine, okay, <laughs> We don't call it today. I like some Doritos and some non-alcoholic sacramental church wine. No, what we say, I like some Doritos and I'd like some Welch's grape juice, right? Someone that was looking out and saying, how can we remove stumbling blocks? Number four, you refocus on what's important. Paul writes, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Paul gets their eyes again on the big picture, the kingdom of God, gets his eyes on the king, the rule of the king, on Jesus, on what's most important. He transcends all of all that might divide us. He gets their eyes on him and he says, you know what? Following Jesus, the rule of Jesus, the kingdom of God is not about you eat this or you don't eat this. You wear sandals, you don't wear sandals. You do this, you do that. No, no, the kingdom of God is about being right standing with God, having the peace, having peace with God, and having the joy of God, the joy of salvation, and then taking that and living it out so that I'm working to have right living with my neighbors and with Christians, and I'm learning to be and working for peace, and I'm also experiencing joy. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Jesus is ruling and hearts are being changed. It's not on all these externals getting caught up in them. Notice too, in this way, uh, it's pleasing to God and receives human appro- approval that uh, when we are keeping the main thing, the main thing, Jesus at cent- the center, it's pleasing to God. We're not fighting and arguing over little things. I don't know if you recall, I remember, I've, it was a number of years ago now, uh, there was a church, and uh, in the church, um, they were having a Christmas program, so, you know, of course, they brought in a Christmas tree onto the platform, or maybe it was Christmas, no, it was a Christmas tree onto the platform, and there were some in this church that said, there's no way we're having a, a, a Christmas tree on the, on the platform in church because uh, they had pagan origins, and, and we don't want that there. And the other group said, we're not so sure it was pagan or- origins. It might have been Martin Luther that's w- when the Christmas tree s- thing started. Or even if it was a symbol of paganism years ago, it's not today. We're having the Christmas tree in the church. Well, this group came and took the Christmas tree and started walking out of the church with the Christmas tree. Some from the other group took the Christmas tree, started going back this way with it. There's a struggle, and I think one person was injured, but anyway, they ended up suing each other over the Christmas tree. And again, of course, the, the outside world looking on caught this, and, you know, Christians fighting over a Christmas tree. Do you think that that pleases God? Not for a moment. Jesus is blocked. As he says, Paul says in Romans 12, when we call ourselves followers of God or we're supposed to be the followers of God and we do something that doesn't represent Christ, Christ's name is blasphemed among the nations. So how we treat one another, it really does matter. We need to keep refocusing on what's important. And then lastly, number five, you pursue peace and mutual edification with those who differ with you. Verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Roll up your sleeves, go to the other Christian, try to work it out. Don't put the phony smile on, but just say, hey, can we talk? And if you need to agree to disagree, that's okay. But when you're doing that, you're listening, you're learning, and you're saying, okay, God, you got this. I'm going to give some liberty here. I'm going to keep my arms open. I'm not going to cross them and say, you're not welcome here. I want to be in right relationship with all Christians. We talk here at Woodside about following Jesus and real life with Jesus. Well, here's what it looks like. It means that at times we're praising each other, but at times it means that we need to apologize and forgive one another. It means that we're rallying around those things that we agree with, but we're also living 
and learning and growing in those areas or points of disagreement. In other words, at Woodside, as we follow Jesus, there's room to agree on things, but there's also room to not agree on certain things. And just one final note, uh, tonight at the congregational meeting, our annual general meeting, uh, I'm going to brag about the staff and the elders and the deacons just a a little bit, but I want to brag this morning just about our congregation here at Woodside because I really believe uh, we are living out Romans 14. I think there's, of course, there's always areas of improvement. But we, in the essentials, there is unity. In this culture that has shifted, and this is no longer right, and how do you think that? We are standing on the word of God. We're not moving. But in the non-essentials, we're allowing liberty. I'm not sure if you realize it, but there are people who see different issues in a different way than you do. And they might even be sitting right next to you for all I know. But they do. But that's okay. They're secondary issues, disputable matters. And at Woodside, I really believe that we truly are loving one another in all things charity. So let's continue, Woodside, that we may together lift up the name of Jesus. I invite you to stand as the worship team comes and leads us in a song.